Hi, everybody. And here we go. We are back here again. And looks like almost the same topic. Uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder review of MRI stigmata. Uh, first of all, thanks, Dr. Chakra, for invite again. So we will focus on NMO uh, related NMOSD mostly uh, with on MOG related disease. I have no financial disclosures or conflict of interest. Most of the slides, as you can imagine, uh, were presented. There are some modifications. So let's go back in the history in the timeline as we should. So it dates back to probably 19th century. And then in, uh, fast forward 2004, we had a discovery of aquaporin 4 and it changed a lot. And then we uh, had the term NMOSD coined in, in 2007 and then came the IPND criteria. Uh, so in nutshell, there has been evolving NMO diagnostic concept. Initially, we thought it's optic neuritis and myelitis. And in real sense, we used to think that it's not MS, although a lot of people thought that it's a variant of MS. And then came the NMO uh, seropositivity on the horizon. And the concept sort of changed that now we start thinking that it can be like MS. And then came the MOG associated disease. And then, of course, came the NMOSD 2015 criteria. So it kind of represent here this evolving diagnostic concept of NMO, which now we call NMOSD with small contribution by MOG disease. So let's go back, back to the basics. Uh, aquaporin 4 receptor distribution, which is interesting and important for me as a radiologist because it represents the and reflects the MR pattern of disease. It is a most abundant water channel in CNS, in the astrocytic foot process. And it is ventricular blood flow rich regulatory organs with reduced blood brain barrier. And I don't think it'd be wrong to say that MS can be termed as a perivenous disease in general versus NMO related demyelinating disease as periependymal as we will see and observe their distribution and pattern on MRI. So here we go. This is the 2015 famous IPND criteria for NMOSD. Of course, uh, we're not going to go by each uh, clause here. In fact, we have to simplify it. And for a radiologist, the best way to simplify it to show you an illustrated form of the criteria. And we are lucky that the six core clinical characteristic in the criteria have a correlate MRI features. And here we go. In a snapshot, you have the whole criteria in front of you. So I have optic neuritis on a coronal fat suppressed T1 image, bilateral optic nerve enhancement, then the classic transverse myelitis longitudinally extensive throughout the cord. And then we have an area post syndrome in the dorsal medulla, and then diffuse brainstem involvement in a brainstem syndrome, diencephalic syndrome with involvement of the thalamus, and then uh, typical and actually peculiar cerebral lesions. So if the patient is NMO zero positive, you need one of these uh, core clinical characteristics for diagnosis. But if it is negative, then you need at least two. And out of these two, at least one of them has to be uh, these three core clinical characteristics, which I am going to reiterate and reemphasize again and again. So reemphasizing and reiterating here, unifying and new facts about this entity. NMO positivity, as we have learned over the years, is not must for this diagnosis. Uh, optic neuritis or myelitis, of course, not must unless aquaporin 4 negative plus the area post syndrome. And cerebral lesions can be present unless our previous concept that cerebral lesions are probably typically found only in MS. And it is a predominantly periependymal disease if aquaporin 4 positive. So MRI has a crucial diagnostic role, specifically if the patients are negative for NMO. Then with the uh, arrival of the criteria, uh, the literature is there, which, uh, which shows that there is increasing uh, diagnosis of NMOSD now. And also we have to remember that they are mutually exclusive so they cannot be uh, positive in both of them, the NMO uh, and the MOG seropositivity. 
and it is very rare to be uh, positive in both cases. MOG and MOSD or um, MOG associated disease had its own peculiarities and we will definitely touch upon them. So again, enhanced role of MRI and MOG diagnosis as you witness that there is corresponding clinical uh, sorry, there is corresponding MR stigmata of these core clinical characteristics. And some MR features, very important, are red flags for the NMOSD diagnosis. And the two of them, I should definitely mention that uh, cortical lesions and dorsal fingers. And I'll discuss this again as well at the end. So MR has a significant diagnostic role, uh, particularly if the patient is seronegative for uh, NMO or Equaporin 4. So let's move to each, uh, let's discuss each of the core clinical characteristics. So we start with optic neuritis on MRI in NMOSD. It is the core diagnostic feature, and as I showed you, it is one of the must if the patient is seronegative for Equaporin 4. So optic nerves can be generally divided into a tier segment and posterior segment. There are multiple segments, as you see here. And it has some significance in differentiating NMOSD versus uh, MS and even within NMOSD, NMO, and MOG. So you can see here in NMOSD, usually there is multi-segmental and bilateral disease. There is posterior predilection as well, which is more common in NMO positive patients. And here we go for the multiple sclerosis we commonly see in our practice. It, typically, it's unilateral, focal, and more likely to be anterior. But of course, there is significant overlap in distribution of these lesions. So more extensive, more bilateral, more posterior disease uh, is in favor of optic neuritis from NMOSD. And we will discuss MOG and equipore is the uh, schematic for the optic uh, disc edema, which is actually peculiar for MOG associated disease. And by the way, you are all familiar that bilaterality of optic neuritis in MS is almost unheard of. It would be very rare. And the same thing with optic disc edema doesn't happen typically in multiple sclerosis. So what do we have here? We have a coronal T2 image, which is fat suppressed or it's also called stir image. Normally you could see optic nerve surrounded by CSF. So the defect is lost in myelination. So I call it ab absent optic nerve sign on T2 imaging. Then you do the contrast fat suppressed T1 image, typically coronal, best for orbital imaging. And you can see bilateral optic nerve enhancement. So the optic nerves are bright appearing and the optic nerve sheath surrounding is not enhancing, but it can enhance in MOG related disease. And here we go, we go posteriorly in the same patient. So contiguous, so longitudinally extensive optic neuritis as you go back coronally and bilateral optic nerve enhancement. So is there any difference between MOG and NMO related optic neuritis? As I alluded to, there is some uh, differences. So there is a high recurrence with op MOG optic neuritis, but residual visual defect is uh, there can be, but it's better outcome than NMO-related optic neuritis. And MOG favor the anterior segment, the optic disc edema, which is also anterior. And what is uh, also uh, kind of peculiar to MOG-related optic neuritis is perineural enhancement, as you see this in this uh, schematic. And I'll show you some example as well. What about NMO or equaporin for optic neuritis? Uh, it, of course, is uh, part of NMOSD, so mm, it can be bilateral, but it has more predilection for posterior involvement of the segments. So what do we have here is a multiple sclerosis, very uh, familiar kind of appearance for you guys, that there is unilateral focal segmental optic neuritis. Then we have a uh, NMO-related optic neuritis, and this is more posterior with optic chiasm involvement and more unilateral but posterior but if there is bilateral extensive optic nerve involvement here on t2 bright signal and then enhancing it can be uh, nmosd but in this particular case it is more likely to be mog related nmosd or mog related optic neuritis so again bilateral longitudinal extensive optic neuritis is highly suggestive of NMOSD. And if there is posterior involvement, you will favor equiporin 4 compared to MOG, which is more likely to be anterior. 
So next, the next core clinical characteristic after optic neuritis would be myelitis, of course. So it is also one of the three must if patient is seronegative for aquaporin-4. And this is a very typical and classic appearance, as you can see here, that there is longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis with uh, involvement of three or more segments, as you can visualize here. And if you do axial T2 imaging, you can see that the spinal cord, there is a more extensive transverse involvement as well. Remember that there is central gray matter which is involved and there is more than 50%. So it is not only longitudinally extensive, but it is also transversely extensive. And typically they don't enhance, but if you give enhancement, you may see rim enhancement, sort of a lens shape enhancement of these lesions. And uh, MR can be helpful actually from clinical standpoint that NMSD recurrence or relapse can happen in the same location, particularly in spinal cord. It would be hard clinically whether it's a relapse or pseudo relapse. And actually that's one of the occasion in which uh, follow-up MRI can be helpful as we will discuss. So we forget about short segment myelitis and studies have shown that actually it's not always longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. As you see here in this patient started with a focal lesion, patchy lesion, and then on follow-up, actually, there is more longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. So it can be the initial and only manifestation of NMOSD. And this lesion still not very long, but it can be up to two segments. So it should not exclude the diagnosis of NMOSD. And of course, you can imagine that they can be initially confused with multiple sclerosis because that is a much more common entity. And I would I'm, I imagine that IPND diagnostic criteria may incorporate at some point short segment myelitis as well. And here one uh, patient with focal enhancement of the lesion. So there is an important concept about T1 signal uh, in demyelinating disease in the spinal cord. This is a case of multiple sclerosis. You can see patchy lesions typical for MS, but we forget to uh, look at T1 images and you can see here that there is a normal appearance of T1 image, although there is a lesion, unlike NMOSD. As you can see here, there's a uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, but of course it's evident on T2 imaging. And if you pay attention, the signal is very, very bright T2. So it's like a CSF and even evident on T1, which is uh, uncharacteristic of MS lesion, typically in spinal cord, they are not evident. So that's something to keep in the back of the mind, differentiate. And furthermore, you can uh, now talk about bright spotty lesions. So there is longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, again, evident on T1. But on T2 imaging, this has some blotchy appearance, which is called bright spotty lesion. And it can even become like a H sign. And they say it may be from necrosis or edema or CSF trapping. So this is something characteristic described in the literature if you see them in your cases. And uh, some of these studies have shown very high specificity for bright spot in lesion, which would uh, be more uh, favorable for the NMOSD. The myelitis in NMOSD is longitudinally as well as transverse. The and there is central transverse myelitis with gray matter involvement and even can result in an H sign. I'll show you later. And also remember bright spotty lesion when you do the uh, axial T2 imaging through this lesion. And also remember the hypo intense T1 signal. Next, we move on to the brainstem lesions on MRI and area postima you already saw, but there can be lesion elsewhere in the uh, brainstem and area postima is one of the three mandatory if the patient is zero negative for aquaporin 4. So what we see here is a dorsal very typical involvement of the area postima. Patient uh, present with intractable hiccup, nausea and vomiting. And then we have a longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. But what I'm trying to show you here is the extension into the area postrema. So it, uh, brainstem lesion uh, can happen up to 50% of cases. They can be very non-specific. And again, this there is a dorsal predilection compared to ADM or MS. And as we discussed, this, there is a periependymal and periquidectal predilection. And medulla is more favored site 
and they can be contiguous with the cervical cord as I showed you here. And here is one of our case from SKMC that this was a relapsing disease and you can see extensive involvement of the brainstem and it was relapsed in the same location. So what is, how can we uh, differentiate a little bit between uh, MS and NMOSD brainstem lesions? So we all are well familiar with MS lesions in the brainstem. They love to happen in the pons and middle cerebellar peduncle, which is also called breaking pontus. But uh, in ADEM, for example, a little bit pre, pre pondus or pre dilection to be in the midbrain and ventral, as you see here, somewhat similar to the MS. But in the NMOSD, there is more pre dilection in the dorsal, particularly in the area postima. So, something to keep in mind. Then moving on to the diencephalic lesions with uh, very characteristic uh, symptomatology. Lesion actually usually asymptomatic and they can present with these uh, symptoms and presentations. So we have a hypothalamic lesion, medial thalamus and periaqueductal lesion as well shown here. So next is brain lesion, which is actually more important. And now we know that in 50% or more of these patients can have brain lesions, and it is one of the core clinical characteristics. And of course, it is not one of the three mandatory ones if the patient is zero negative for NMO. So brain lesions in NMO, as I said, it's a spectrum uh, ranging from 45% to 90% incidence. They are usually non-specific, and that's where the problem happens. They can confuse us, and we can diagnose this patient with MS, and they can meet that criteria. These are uh, clinically silent lesions, and what we can do is look for relative specific lesion, as I will show you in the next slide. And lesion can be quite large and tumefactive, but enhancement, as we see with tumefactive lesion, is not that common. So these are just examples of these kind of spindle-shaped lesions, which can be rather specific if they are present. So here is more specific lesions in the brain, and we start with the corpus callosum, favorite site for demyelination. So kind of arch appearance or marble appearance. And also focus, this is quite specific for NMOSD that there can be isolated lesions around the uh, corticospinal tract, posterior limb, internal capsule, and with a trident appearance and much better example here uh, with surrounding edema. So they can have corticospinal tract involvement. In terms of enhancement, as you see here, it's quite uh, characteristic actually if it's present and you don't see this in MS, this is called pencil thin enhancement or uh, cloud-like heterogeneous enhancement. So these were kind of uh, relative specific appearances of brain lesions. So what we did uh, in a kind of a rapid mode that we covered the uh, six core clinical characteristics using the MRI or imaging spectacle, but always what the dilemma is, is it MS or not? and there can be some discriminatory features. So there are few papers on that, for example, this one. So before that, let's look at it, how MS looks, revisit that again, Dawson fingers, anterior temporal periventricular lesions, and then well-defined lesions around the body of the lateral ventricle, and then uh, very characteristic uh, sub, uh, subcortical, sorry, juxtacortical, I should be specific, Dextracortical U fiber S shaped lesions. So, these features, if present, this would be red flags against the diagnosis of NMOSD, and you have to think of multiple sclerosis. In this particular study, actually, none of the NMOSD case had Dawson type lesion, but you have to be careful that you have to apply strict criteria of Dawson uh, lesions. It should be well defined, perpendicular orientation, and at least three millimeter in size if you apply that criteria most likely you will diagnose MS correctly. And on the other hand, you will diagnose NMOSD correctly if they are absent. So what are the peculiarities of MOG related demyelination or MOG associated disease in terms of NMOSD? So the ophthalmologist will tell you that they are seeing the optic disc edema, which is uh, quite characteristic for MOG associated optic neuritis. And they say it's quite common. But what is more important for me is MRI. So there is bilateral optic neuritis, as you see, enhancing optic. Plus what else? There is a ring around it, which is the optic nerve sheath. So perineural sheath, I showed you the schematic. 
here is bilateral and here is lateral in this patient and it can be found up to 50 percent and in spinal cord there is a predilection for uh, mid to lower spinal cord with uh, patchy lesions and as we see here enhancing lesions and i mentioned to you that central gray matter is uh, um, uh, NMOSD likes to involve it and in MOG disease actually it can turn out to be a uh, shape of H and that's why it's called H sign if you have it it uh, may not be that common so these are the characteristic uh, relative specific characteristic for MOG associated disease and when we talk about MOG disease we should definitely talk about involvement of cortical and juxtacortical involvement as you see here and this would be very uh, uncharacteristic for NMO related NMOSD or demyelination. As you see here, cortical involvement and even patchy blotchy lesion in uh, palm. So the, the point is that the MOG related disease somewhat getting closer to multiple sclerosis because multiple sclerosis now we have seen on high, uh, high strength or ultra high strength MRIs that it can involve the cortex. So and that's why MOG also has association with epilepsy. A uh, few slides about pediatric NMOSD, uh, or we may say that we should talk about MOG associated disease because that's very common. And, and NMOSD constitute a very small part of MOG associated disease. So there is a overlapping entities in terms of pediatric acquired demyelinating syndromes or recurrent demyelinating syndromes. So the three major one is multiple sclerosis, NMOSD, aquaporin 4, or uh, MOGAD or MOG associated disease. And you can see in the picture, there are so many entities with so much overlap. The diagnostic criteria in pediatric NMOSD is uh, the same as adults. Uh, it is not very common, as I mentioned before, uh, more common in 10 to 12 years of age, more common in females, Cerebral lesions are actually more common and they can be quite larger and MOG positivity is uh, much higher. As you see again, this bilateral optic neuritis in NMOSD in pediatric patient and you can see this, this one, fat suppressed T1 post contrast image and your recovery is much higher in this group of patients. So uh, let's look at this long, uh, long two extensive transverse myelitis. In pediatric patient, as you see that this can be found in other entities, particularly ADEM. So it may not be very specific. In adults, it can be quite specific and helpful for us. And then brain lesions are more common and actually they are uh, larger in pediatric NMOSD. So let's uh, have a few words about monitoring role of MRI. And I've been told that you have to do follow-up MRIs routine like MS in these patients. Uh, for the reason of insurance reimbursement. But what does the evidence say? There was a recent paper and we discussed this as a review paper. So disability in NMOSD uh, is attacks dependent and probably you know better than me. And the treatment goal is attacks prevention. There is no MR detectable damage outside clinical attacks. That's the general concept. And uh, no real uh, conclusive biomarkers to predict lack of treatment response, including MRI. And I would like to hear from you about this as well. But contrast enhanced MRI at, uh, actually can be helpful in some cases, for example, to differentiate true versus pseudo, uh, true versus pseudo relapse, as I showed you a case. Uh, actually, I alluded to this before. So the question is, is routine follow-up with MRI warranted? And this paper, uh, which I'm going to show you, they say no. But in some cases, and in some paper, they say, uh, if you are really interested to monitor the atrophy and uh, neurodegenerative changes, uh, maybe you can do MRI, it will show progressive atrophy. So in this paper, spinal cord and brain MRI should be routinely performed during follow-up in patients with NMOSD. They put this question and their answer is actually no. So, and this is a example from one of the study which did look at the longitudinal MR brain uh, imaging of neuromyelitis optica. And they say one quarter of these lesions completely disappeared, but the rest stayed, but about 80% actually this lesion regressed over time. And I, as you know that 
at the MR will be, uh, if the patient has clinical attack, and then the patient may get MRI and it will be positive. Silent lesions are uh, kind of not that concept like multiple sclerosis. And there is another paper, recent paper, uh, they use the ultra high field MRI of brain lesions. And they also showed that there was not much change over time. So uh, I showed this slide before, and we need to talk about ultra high field MRI because that's a major area of research, particularly in MS and sent the famous central vein sign, as you see here, the vein and surrounding T2 signal, even it can be evident on three Tesla MRI uh, in even up to 90% of the patients. So it does reflect perivenular pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis, but it can be found in other diseases, particularly small vessel disease. And they come up with this rule that more than 60% of the lesion uh, should have CVS with a high specificity, or you can use the uh, six or more lesions rule. Uh, what about NMOSD? Actually, it can be found in NMOSD up to 30% in this one study, and even specifically in uh, MOG-related disease, it can be found in 12%. So it can be found in NMOSD. Uh, what about cortical lesion, which is also uh, well seen in the ultra high field MRI. And you can see here, so typically it's favorite diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and no cortical lesions were seen specifically in the aquaporin for NMOSD. But this is an example of NMOSD and you see cortical lesion. So what are, why I'm showing this slide? Because MOG uh, related disease or MOG related NMOSD uh, has a predilection for cortical lesions. And even the studies have shown that there is even deep gray matter atrophy without white matter disease. So there is again some uh, closeness and relationship uh, with multiple sclerosis. So let's keep that in mind as well. So let's, we finally reach the summary statement. And as I, as you witness, that there is correlative MR stigmata for clinical characteristics of NMOSD. So that's where the uh, MRI can be quite helpful and reassuring for you. And MRI plays a crucial role specifically in aquaporin for seronegative patients uh, in terms of diagnosis. And it is mostly a periependymal disease, unlike MS, which is generally termed a perivenous disease, of course, with an overlap. Uh, optic neuritis, one of the core uh, and mandatory clinical characteristic if the patient is seronegative. So typically it's bilateral and extensive, specific, especially if MOG related optic neuritis. And myelitis, longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis is the typical stigmata, but we should not forget the short segmental myelitis as I showed you, and the patient may present with that and can be confused with multiple sclerosis. And brainstem uh, predilection is dorsal brainstem, particular area post tremor. And then MOG associated disease, as we now all know, that it uh, is a, a well established entity now. It's a, it has distinguished features on MRI as well. And pediatric NMOSD, lastly, it is relatively less common and it is more likely going to be uh, MOG associated disease. Uh, at the end, uh, there is no clear role of MRI as a monitoring tool, but you can uh, do it for different reasons. As I showed you some evidence that MRI uh, is kind of silent disease, uh, so we, we don't need MRI. And, and unlike MS, NMOSD um, comes in attacks, and so you will be clinically diagnosing it anyway.